my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hobakemian. Professor Hobakemian is the W. Grafton and Lillian B. Wilkins Professor of Mechanical Science and Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. The title of her talk today is Self Learning and Control with L1 Adaptation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hoba Kimian to give her talk. Professor. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me as one of your speakers for this workshop. So I'll get started on um, our talk, which uh, I have titled Self Learning and Control with L1 Adaptation. So let's see what's going on in the world, right? So the movie that you see here on the left that has lost more than 10 million views. I just checked it last summer and maybe today it's more. That shows basically how a robot can run, jump, fall, collect data, learn based on the collected data and continue running. On the right, you see a Rubik cubic that all of us have played obviously at some point in our uh, young days. Uh, these type of approaches where you use trial and error based learning uh, can be maybe good for an animation or a cubic rubik, but it's unacceptable for safety critical systems, the ones that um, you see here. So uh, here we have a number of safety critical systems with which we work today with self-driving cars, drones, or flying the Learjet like we have here on the left. Uh, uh, Failures are unacceptable because every failure can lead to human death. That's why counting on collecting data, learning based on the failure, uh, the collected data going forward is just unacceptable because the failure can be catastrophic. So what's lying at the heart of the learning based control uh, setup? There is a model learning algorithm that learns the model from the collected data, including the failures, and based on that optimizes the controllers. So such an architecture will, will be very sensitive to different types of uncertainties, including component failures, environmental uncertainties, disturbances, and uh, loss of performance and stability guarantees for robots under uncertainty are an absolute requirement if we are dealing with safety critical systems. So safety must be built into the control architecture by design, by the approach, by the philosophy. So if I look into that setup again, and I kind of account for uncertainties, what we are saying that we need a safety controller that would be always there to guarantee your safety, regardless of the performance of your learning algorithm. Because the learning algorithm largely depends upon the data and learning takes time. While in the process as you collect the data, you want your safety to be always guaranteed. Recalling back our junior level control class, uh, where we learn about transient performance, steady state performance, time delay margin, and disturbance rejection, we can see that these are the requirements for the safety controller to have at place and to stand behind those, regardless of the performance of the learning. So our L1 adaptive controller is capable of guaranteeing your robustness and performance by definition through analytical proofs. So it decouples the estimation and control loop with a low pass filter so that the performance of the estimation loop is not affected by any of the uncertainties around the system. It enables to increase the estimation rates arbitrarily high and the low pass filter uh, definition of the control signal helps us to filter out the high frequencies that they never reach the system, which are typical in the presence of high estimation rates. This control architecture we were capable of commercializing for evolution autopilot of rain marine, hydraulic pumps of Caterpillar, for a large number of drones across the world and uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, plus it was tested at experimental rig of Statoil in Norway for drilling operations where high pressure uncertainties are critical for uh, stable uh, pumping of the oil um, in again, another safety critical environment. So what we are kind of exploring these days is how to use L1 adaptive controller with machine learning based approaches so that we can benefit from the versatility offered by the machine learning methods yet have the performance and robustness guarantees get, uh, ensured by L1 adaptive controller. So just to remind L1 adaptive controller enables us to derive decoupled guaranteed performance and bounds, which can be split into two terms. One of them is inverse proportional to the rate of adaptation that enables us to increase the estimation rate arbitrarily high, while the low pass filter bandwidth helps us to control the robustness margin. 
So this decoupling of the performance bound helps us in uh, tuning very reliable control architecture. So the L1 adaptive control history has kind of a timeline, which we show here. We started first in 2006, so they were 15 years in history. And uh, at first uh, we were able to fly some small UAVs with Naval Postgraduate School and showed immediately right the same year when we had the theory in ACC, we had the GNC paper on flight test. Later, we were able to test it on NASA's unmanned aerial vehicles, um, the Air Star platform, which is a subscale commercial jet, 5.5% model of one of the famous aircraft. Later, we were able to test it on different models offered to us by Raytheon, uh, Boeing, as I said, through a number of different industries outside aerospace. Uh, and starting 2015, we were flying on Learjet F-16, and today we are integrating machine learning algorithms to enable safe learning within L1 adaptive control architecture. Just to give a brief overview, because these Learjet flights are always exciting, I'll run one of these Learjet flight tests in which the pilots are tasked to do Cooper Harbor rating. Just to give you an idea for those of you who are not from aerospace industry, when you are flying a smooth, nice, uh, um, kind of ride in an airplane without fasten seatbelt signs. It's called level um, flying quality is level one. And the minute you get disturbances and you get this fasten seatbelt signs, so there is degradation of the flying qualities. It goes to grade two, three, and so on. So here the pilots are tasked to find, uh, to determine the flying qualities of the aircraft in a presence of an accidental um, um, situation. This uh, test airplane at Edward Air Force Base are instrumented in a way where they can inject a different type of failures and have the pilots compensate for it. So they have to give a grading how bad it is and how much L1 recovered. And it's, it's so bad that they are not able to read the paper and they're asking to bring on the controller so that to give the rating. So let's look it. So I hope you all see and you will hear the pilot's audio soon. Um, I've been asked to tune the voice minimally so that uh, it wouldn't be ear creeping for all of you. So let's see, I just gave you the interpretation so you know what you're watching, how the pilots are stressed and they are not able to read the picture. Constantly overshooting my desired bank though. From here you see the face. Jason's probably hating life right now. Yep. You're, uh, you're right around 27. I'd recommend you just do the task with L1 on and don't okay. do both tracks. Got it. Can. All right, so you, you did not get adequate on that one? Okay. Okay, so if you want to run through a CHR real quick, you did not get adequate. So we're starting in... Can I get L1 on as we do the uh, yep, sorry. <laughs> scoring, please? Yep. There's your sorry. answer. Yeah. There's your answer, right? All right, L1's coming on in three, two, one. Now L1 is on. Thank you. Rush, if you didn't ask, I was going <laughs> to... So now we see landing situation where they're trying to land with again an upscale dynamics. And you'll see by the end, you got the airplane, right? Uneventful is the word to watch out for. 200 feet. Ground effect, you see that? Yep. Got yeah, okay. That's uneventful to me. Very uneventful. Okay, so with this, we got some uh, media, obviously, so you, uh, Aviation Week published for us. And then in 2016, we had the chance to fly the F-16, which unfortunately I'm not able to show. And we'll uh, see some more releases on that next year when we fly it again. Then we had the 2018 flight test and let me run this one. So here they were able uh, to implement some of the, um, this aircraft model dynamics from 1967 where likely the pilot survived. 
so this is the beauty of this test aircraft that they can take some of the prior data and load and um, implement it in real flight and help let the pilot compensate for it. So in the second round of flight tests, we were already more experienced in terms of how to take the movies and how to show our results better. Now, um, let's see what's happening in our airplane when this accident data is loaded here. So at first there is no L1 and we see how the accident is taken. I can't even control your airplane. Do you have your airplane? So immediately the VSS comes on and saves the aircraft. So the safety switches are there. Hey, task in three, two, one. So you can feel there in high frequency, I uh, made it some high frequency inputs, excited the roll. Lower frequency, the roll overshoot or oscillation tendency is less. Sounds good. There's still some there. Pitch, I'm having no issues. Fine tracking and um, gross tracking are very good in pitch. All right, and I have the maneuver complete. And now we go with engine out. So engine out, they're letting uh, at first the without pilot compensation, then with pilot compensation, and then with L1 All right, without. recording on in ready, ready, pack. Running. Okay, power is coming back. My hands are free. Three, two, one, now. <laughs> Controls fixed. And recover, please. Okay, and recovering. Power's back. I'm ready to try this now with um, you, with a pilot correcting for it. So. Okay, okay, I'll give it about one second of reaction time. I am on conditions. All right, and then recording on my call. Ready, ready, pack. On. Okay, power. It'll be left throttle. Okay. In three, two, one, now. One potato and recovery. And recording off. Okay, recording off, matching throttles. With pilot, he was able to reduce from 20 to 12 degree degradation. With L1, we get to three degree. I'm and ready for the pilot. recording on ready, ready, pack. Uh -huh. Okay, left throttle coming back in three, two, one, now. I'm not touching the controls. Nice demonstration. Yeah, check that out. About three degrees of left bank. Speeding in the rudder to match. I can feel that. It is descending a little bit, but it's yeah, descending a bit, but that would be easy to compensate for. Yeah. Okay. I think you got some good data there. Right. Yep. Recording matching, off. Matching power recordings coming off. So this is what I tell my students that in real world there is no zero. Zero is an artificial number invented in mathematics to make everything work. So three degrees is pretty good for this uh, scenario. So we again got some press and media here uh, by aviation we. And uh, moving forward, I can just talk of different other applications that are running in our lab, for example, how to use small drones for different tasks by like helping elder and so on. And uh, obviously, this type of already robotic applications bring new types of challenges because robotic applications have specific tasks to address. And this is like how, for example, we provide help uh, around households say Amazon package delivery, the drone comes to deliver, we study how safe will people feel. And this small kind of reminder of a Disney movie just says that, for example, a robotic bird, a robotic bird can be used for showering people, and then the question is how safe you would feel. Actually, for instance, demonstrate clear evidence of the fact that the payload can change, so the uncertainties can be catastrophic for the housekeeper safely. And then the question is if she feels safe. So to study such systems, we collaborate with, for example, psychologists. We use um, GSR sensors, like you see here, to study human perception of safety because psychologists obviously will perceive safety differently. If in engineering, 
exclusion avoidance can be counted for safety, then people can be stressed in the presence of these devices. So people's perception of safety is different from collision avoidance. These are already interdisciplinary uh, projects that we've pursued with psychologists and uh, we have some papers published. You can follow our publications on archive on, uh, in different uh, journals and conferences. Moving forward, uh, we started collaboration with the Georgia Tech Group. Evangelos Theodoro was one of the finalists for the Alpha Pilot competition that was launched by Lockheed Martin together with MIT, where they have this simulated environment and the drones have to race, fly through windows and through narrow gates. And naturally, such environments bring new challenges for us. The new challenges uh, have to do with the unpredictable environment, uncertain dynamics, um, and we need we have new requirements that require fast replanning, safe planning, safe control, and like learning for high performance with guaranteed environment. So this is what motivates bringing machine learning methods into the L1 adaptive control architecture to benefit from the versatility offered by them. So a, a standard autonomy stack, many of you would know, includes a planner and a controller. So the planner generates a trajectory and an open loop controller, and the controller, the feedback controller, attempts to track using a feedback law. So what are our challenges? Challenges that the uncertainties can drive the system to failure, like you see here. So it can come and get stuck into an obstacle. So a controller needs to compensate for uncertainties, and the compensation uh, is highly desirable to be provided in the form of certificates, guarantees, which will enable two-way communication between the planner and the controller for safety. So a controller generates a tube and guarantees that the system can remain inside the tube. The tube is centered around the desired trajectory, say with the radius row. A typical robust controller will always compute your performance bounds and tell you that you will stay within this bound given this level of uncertainty. The two-way communication between the controller and the planner, which are both on the system, so ensure that the controller communicates a row to the planner so that the planner communicates XD and UD in a way. So this is the desired path of controller so that the trajectory always remains inside the tube. So the planner has to be aware of the controller capabilities. So in that case, we can ensure that safety is always guaranteed. However, what about the performance? If we operate with our maximum uh, kind of conservative regarding the knowledge of the uncertainties, the radius row will be overly conservative and practically unusable. If my row is large, for example, like what you see here, I will never be able to navigate through this passage safely because my large row will collide with all kinds of obstacles. So we need some type of machine learning right here to make sure we can learn the uncertainties on the go so that our uh, safety tube can be made narrower yet be safer. So we want our guarantees to be as fine as possible, the fine tuning, right? So here is when we say that uh, the uh, performance, uh, the safety is a requirement, necessity, while the performance is a luxury. So what's also important that the safety should not depend upon the learning because the learning is dependent upon the data we collect, upon the, the environment, communication, upon different types of devices, their performance in the environment that we operate. So our learning performance can be variable. So it can be good, bad, it can happen soon, it can happen later, and it will require restarting in case of large disturbances and so on. So our safety must be always guaranteed regardless of the performance of the learning. While the learning will help us to improve the performance, that's why we call performance is a luxury to have. So, and we need to do all of this with the help of, with guaranteed certificates, because certificates would be our tool to transition the methods into real world and commercialize, right? So what type of uh, machine learning tools to use, right? So that largely depends upon the task. And as we go, we'll illustrate a few of those. And then, of course, once we learn the model, we also need to make sure that uh, those models that we learn can be useful for control design. So we need to be able to extract kind of controllable models from our learned dynamics, because sometimes you may learn a model that's not useful for control design. And as we extract these useful models, we should be able to improve the performance further. So here is our learning based control pipeline, which is a bottom up approach. The foundation is based on control theory. The buildup is based on ML performance, right? On ML, so which gives us the performance. 
and uh, they are united in an architecture that decouples safety from learning. So learning does not affect safety, but only improves the performance if it's well done. So the building blocks. So here is that robust adaptive control architecture that I will soon uh, discuss how we have integrated model predictive path integral controller with L1 to navigate to the Google flight environment that you just saw that I said like it Martin built it with MIT. We'll use Bayesian learning for learning the system dynamics. We'll refer to it like Riemannian energy L1 with GP and that would help us to improve the performance. And we'll bring in deep incrementally stabilizing controller to extract useful models for control design from that learned model. Let me go now block by block. So at first, we'll talk about integrating a planner with the controllers. So here it is. Uh, so why do we use MPPI? Because it helps uh, with parallelization and it's a sampling based controller. And we augment it with L1 for ensuring stability and robustness in the face of uncertainties. A quick review of the MPPI and L1 augmentation. Here we have a nominal system with unknown nonlinearity disturbances. MPPI is an optimal control computation forward in time for nominal system. And it updates the control sequence iteratively by sampling thousands of trajectories. L1 adaptive controller robustly fights against the disturbances and the uncertainties. So this type of architecture helps us to leverage parallel sampling for modern GPUs that MPPI requires, and we can handle complex, possibly non-differentiable dynamics and cost functions. Here is what we got when we implemented it in a Google environment that you just now saw a few minutes ago. This is the architecture that Georgia Tech has, and without L1 augmentation, you will see that it goes through few gates. Here is on the left, here is on the right, it's the cleaner environment for easy watching. And after going through a few gates, it crashes. So once it crashes, we add, we bring in L1 now to repeat the whole scenario and we see through how many more gates we go. Obviously it helps us to go through five more extra gates and uh, we can still tune it further and get real flight in the lab. So the pandemic has slowed down a little bit the development of the flight in the Viking lab, but uh, we have them already. We just have to tune it fine before uploading on YouTube and uh, when it can be shared. So basically with L1, you see that it goes through those gates where it crashed. So we had an instantaneous pause there. And here is the table of it that basically shows how L1 uh, cleared a few gates that uh, the MPPI alone was crashing. Uh, moving forward, uh, so we need now to define the certificates uh, for safe motion planning. Uh, for that, we use contraction-based controller. The contraction-based controller, we use it as a baseline controller because it's applicable to large class of nonlinear systems, a finite control, and it also allows to accommodate nonlinear reference systems. When we showed moving through those fancy obstacles, so that's a very nonlinear uh, path that we have to follow. And for a nonlinear system, uh, this contraction-based controller helps us to generate those tubes. A, a quick overview of contraction-based controller. So it's, uh, we call it, we refer to it like Riemannian energy-based um, L1 adaptive controller because we use the Riemannian energy of the system as a Lyapunov function. So we basically solve this optimization problem that you see here where gamma is the geodesic connecting the two neighboring trajectories. And once we solve this optimization problem, we find the control contraction metric that helps us to define the baseline controller. So if we assume that the nominal dynamics of the system in the presence of uncertainties admits a control contraction metric, then with L1 augmentation, we are able to come up with these performance bounds that we can tune each of them dependent upon the uncertainty and the robustness. And uh, the orange one, the external one, is uh, um, what measures our performance against the uncertainty. And the green one is what measures our performance for robustness. So with this type of uh, kind of approach and architecture and the theory with its proofs can be found on archive. Here is a simulated example that we showed how the higher adaptation rate will help us to collapse the external orange tube to the green one and how tuning for the robustness, we can get a narrow and tighter tube, right? Here is a performance without L1, how it crashes into an obstacle. And with L1 augmentation, we are able to stay outside the crashes. 
Now we want to bring in the machine learning, as we said, for model learning that can help us to get finer in our performance tubes. Like here, there is a demonstration that shows as you learn finer and finer, you will be able to go through this narrow, very narrow tube, as you see here, and complete your um, uh, circling without any crashes. So the Bayesian learner helps us to learn the system dynamic with a few data points. It does not require system parametrization. It does not require persistent civic citation. And uh, the key result that helped us to integrate a Bayesian learner with L1 adaptive controllers was given in this paper of 2019 New RIPS conference, where they derive high probability error bound. This high probability error bound, we were able to integrate with the proofs of L1 adaptive controllers to get the performance bound of the overall architecture. If I have to quickly review that paper along with L1 to help you get it. So the Bayesian learner estimates the nonlinearity and the high probability error bound are used in the proofs of L1 adaptive controller. And uh, under the assumption that just Ajax is a Gaussian process, uh, here is how that uh, high probability error bound, uh, I mean, this type of approximation of input output data leads to the following high probability error bound from that very paper. So these are uh, very minor regularity type assumptions. They do not restrict the operation of system in any way. And here is what we get from this learning. So here you see an uncertain system where in the beginning the L1 adaptive controller is able to compensate for the uncertainty. By the time of 35 seconds, we have already collected enough data to see that the performance of the Gaussian regressor is pretty good. And when it's good, basically we have learned the dynamics. L1 has nothing to do, it just dies out naturally. If there is any uncertainty injected into the system at the 35 second, for example, L1 again, is active, it jumps in to compensate for the uncertainty while um, the Gaussian, the GP term in the controller still has uh, time to collect the data to become effective. So L1 is sitting there to guarantee your performance, uh, to guarantee your robustness uh, always at all the time instance with its own performance bound. Yet the learning term, which is naturally integrated in the architecture, uh, proves here to work correctly. So it jumps in and collects the data and learns whenever it's needed. And once it has learned, L1 naturally dies out. Now we want to bring all this together. So if I can learn and if I have robustness, performance guarantees, I have safety tubes, how to make sure that my combined architecture does a better and better job in terms of certificate and everything. So we have a contraction-based controller together with a Bayesian learner that uh, works with the planner to ensure that the planner is aware of the controller capabilities. And uh, we can basically, with the help of learning and all these elements that we brought in into the architecture, we can improve the quality of the plan trajectory. We can take risks to plan uh, to navigate through more narrow, narrow tubes. Like what you see here is the result of it. If I have to start at the left point and come to the right, and this is say a forest with obstacles and my drone has to fly, uh, then as I learn more and more, I'm eventually able to choose a, a finer trajectory, much finer, reducing my time of navigation to 14 seconds as compared to the original 27 seconds. Another example here shows that if I just use my contraction-based controller, then out of 10 random initial conditions, eight will collide with the obstacle. It won't be safe. But if I bring in the Riemannian energy-based L1 with its conservative knowledge of uncertainty, it will not let me navigate through the obstacles. It will give me the safer path outside the obstacles. However, if I, as I add the machine learning to it, the, the kind of uh, what we just now showed, the Gaussian process, so it will help me to go through these narrow passages, giving me a safe narrow tube to follow, then I'm guaranteed not to collide. So this is basically what uh, we meant by, by saying that machine learning will help us to improve the performance. And here is what we got. This is a planner agnostic uh, kind of approach. The way our theory is developed, it's planner agnostic. The previous example was using MPTI and this one uses, for example, BIT star. Here is another example when you have to leave this quadrat and you have to exit wide and narrow. 
uh, without machine learning. So you are just taking this one. And as you kind of do add your learning, you can choose safely take the narrow path and exit through it. So these examples are some of the examples that the students have, pay, uh, have played with to get this analytical verification verification of those analytical results that we get that indeed will find the narrow passage. And the safety is decoupled from learning. So we're always guaranteed to be safe because the learning only improves the performance per hour architecture. That's actually an objective that we have tried to achieve. Now, how to make sure that what we have learned, like this is what I was covering until now, will produce a model from which we can extract a control contraction metric to improve the baseline controller. So what if we learn a model that's not useful for control contraction metric? Control contraction metric was the solution of that optimization problem, if you remember. So let's see if we can extract a control certificate. So we refer to this as deep incrementally stabilizing control that brings up that uh, abbreviation. So uh, what we need, we need optimization-based relaxation of the feasibility problem, the design spaces of the valid control contraction metrics and incremental lacunal functions for feedback loss. So we extract models that are analytically verified to be incrementally exponentially stable. And we use a projection-based approach, basically from the model, uh, once we, uh, once we use the controller and we get the Lyapunov function, so we can parameterize the space of valid candidates using a deep neural network. Now we will learn dynamics because we have learned it, we know what it is. We can use deep neural networks to parameterize them and then do optimization for minimizing the model mismatch. Basically, ideally we want the pink and the blue to, to be as close as possible because uh, pink is what we have learned, right? So once we have learned, we want it to be completely useful for control design so we can have the best uh, control contraction metric, the best baseline controller for solving the problem. So now I will just quickly summarize a few of the big uh, application projects in our lab where we can use this type of controllers. This is another project at NASA where we have the learn to fly model. Learn to fly assumes you take off the vehicle with any PID or some other type of baseline controller that you have and on the go you learn your dynamics. As you learn your dynamics, you can improve your performance um, uh, and update your learned model at a specific frequencies. Of course, here in this context, NASA is using their real-time system identification toolbox that they have for airplane dynamics, so they learn uh, the parameters. And as they use it, so we updated with L1. Here is kind of a slide that would show how uh, last mile delivery uh, problem. Uh, so when Amazon came up with the idea of uh, using uh, drones for package delivery, we said that uh, instead of using locally optimized networks of drones with trucks, we can use um, ride sharing vehicles in the road and have drones pick up and drop up the, the packages on the cars for the last mile delivery. The last mile delivery is typically already very close to people neighborhoods, you have stop signs, slow velocities, uh, traffic lights and so on. So what we do like this, we basically give up on solving a local optimization problem, which is well defined, but it's not scalable. And instead of using ride sharing vehicles, we make the problem scalable and we can transition the solution from one neighborhood to another, from one city to another. But the challenge here is now to solve the stochastic optimization problem of a random traffic flows. And this project, uh, and this other project is NASA's urban air taxi project where we again work with Georgia Tech, you see their uh, self-driving car on Georgia Tech's dirt truck uh, that Evangelos has done lots of experiments with his MPPI controller. And he, he does perceptual control basically here. He uses vision to close the loop. And NASA trusting our L1 controllers for all these flights told us to integrate basically all their advances with ours to enable NASA's urban air taxi kind of project. Uh, maybe. I get another chance to present in a year or two, I will have the experiment from NASA to show. And this is the Virtual Sally project. If you all remember in 2000, 
9 the airplane landed in Hudson, the US, airplane, uh, US Airways Flight 1549, Captain Salenberger took the right decision to land it in Hudson, given the two other airports, he didn't take the risk. And uh, what we do here, we look into how we can have an autonomous system capable of uh, replicating what Captain Salenberger did. So trying to understand what's going on in pilot's brain based on his 42 years of experience that guided him to take this correct decision very quickly based on his knowledge, experience, and intuition. And he was able to save so many uh, passengers, so many lives, right? If we had another younger pilot instead of him, maybe we wouldn't have been able to see uh, this safe landing on Hudson. So we're trying to build kind of a three-layer three adaptation here between the mission planning, task planning, path planning, and say the low level stabilizing controller. And we're trying at the same time to understand how neuroscience uh, could be here helpful to have neuroscience inspired AI solution for uh, scene assessment, task assessment, and uh, identifying the safer paths for landing. This uh, final part that we have to show here, we have two of our drones flying in NASA's autonomy incubator. And these two drones um, have uh, the objective to start from here and land here simultaneously. So this is a time critical mission with special constraints. So they have to communicate and talk over a network that has dropouts, failures, and so on. And while they have the path of this maze, because these are small, crazy fleets, they just don't have the computational power to do real-time path planning, they are doing silhouette of informed shaping of the trajectories to make sure that they smoothly fly through this uh, maze and come back and land at the same location where they started safely. This is a whole another separate hour of presentation, how we decouple space and time in the problem formulation. And we use geometric controllers for path following, leaving velocity free for coordination, which helps us to fly different time critical missions uh, and have the level of precision required for these missions. No machine learning is yet integrated in this flight. However, with all the advances that we have made, we envision being able to do these things also with some uh, augmented machine learning capabilities. So with that, I'm summarizing these presentations. Sorry for the glitch with the Learn to Fly project. Uh, the link will be shared with you in chat. You can watch it. And here is the architecture that I discussed so extensively through this presentation. We have collaborators on all these projects. Uh, like I said, some of the projects involve uh, Evangelos from Georgia Tech, some involve uh, Marco Pavone from Stanford. Uh, the rest are my Illinois team. So Shofeng is now in University of South Carolina, but Petros is now in University of Nevada, Reno. Luis and Vasu Salapak are still with me at the University of Illinois. Uh, some of my acknowledgements for the past uh, team members, my alumni, student, I started L1 with Cheng Yu, then Shofeng helped us with cyber physical system. So all these people have already left my lab, but they have their contribution to this project. This is more or less our current group. Some members already left, uh, but uh, we need to take a new lab picture after pandemic. Some of the papers, if you have the slides, you should be able to follow these papers and uh, acknowledgements to all the sponsors, the flight test team at Edwards Air Force Base for taking the risk to take our controller into blue skies. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for the interesting talk, having myself working on that of control, your framework and architecture relating to such an application is very interesting. Uh, once again, uh, I thank you, Professor Popakemian. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Okay, thank you.